Here in the studio, there are uh, cameras at various angles for the audience to see. And though these telecasts are all in color, they have not been reproduced in color, always in the station. So it was quite an unusual experience to find that we were in color here in the studio, so we could see ourselves. What does one do then with the old black and white? That's what I was thinking about. And there immediately came to my mind the story of a man who was an expert in throwing a boomerang. And he could throw that boomerang around a house, it would come back to him. He could throw it around a tree three or four times, it would come back to him. And a friend saw him and said that he ought to have a really good new boomerang. So he sent to Australia and got a new boomerang inlaid with pearl. And he gave it to the expert. Six months later, he came back to see how the expert was getting on with his new boomerang. And his wife said, he isn't here anymore. He's in a mental hospital. Yes, what happened? He went crazy trying to throw away the old boomerang. <laughs> oh, we're going crazy in this studio trying to throw away the old black and white. My angel is uh, naturally always flying. But do, <laughs> do you know that for a little relaxation, he decided a week ago to take a sea voyage. And there was a terrible storm. And almost everybody in the whole ship was seasick. And a young woman was just getting ready for bed, and she was taken very seasick. And she ran out down the corridor to the bathroom, and the angel, I don't know where an angel gets seasick, but at any rate, my angel did get seasick, and so he dashed out of his room, seasick as he could be, his wings were down, and he bumped into this girl, and oh, she was so ashamed and abashed. He says, all right, lady, I'll never live to tell the story. <laughs> Why did we choose to talk about laughter and humor today? Because really there's a tremendous amount of gloom in the world. Did you know that there is a book entitled Gloom in Modern Literature? One finds it in the novels, like one of John Steinbeck's novel, Kathy, who burned her parents everything that was evil, very serious, play the, many of the dramas that you see today on Broadway are gloomy things. Architecture's gloomy. There's no decoration, nothing to relieve a, a straight line. The songs of the young are gloomy. Imagine a 15, 16-year-old boy and girl singing songs about how their heart is already broken. They're ready to die. But you have to say die 15 times. Die, 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 die. die. <laughs> They're ready to die with gloom. And, but principally, there's no satire. That, I think, proves our over-seriousness. A, you cannot satirize an Irishman, you can't give a brogue. Can't imitate a Jew. Can't imitate Negro dialect. Can't tell jokes about Italians. Can't tell jokes about Poles. Can't tell jokes about Catholics. Can't tell jokes about Protestants. Really, we're a serious people. And when this world is the only world there is, believe me, we've got to be serious. It's like a child that's got a ball and he's told this is the only thing you're ever going to have during life. He can't play with it too much. But if he's told, well, later on you're going to have another one that'll never wear out and always give you great pleasure, oh, he can have fun with this one. 
So, because there's so much gloom, we're going to say something about laughter. Now, you never meet laughter in the universe until you meet man. Man is the only joker in the deck of nature. Hyenas have the mouth, their mouths open, but they do not really laugh. And animals are funny only when they imitate a man. The reason monkeys are funny is because they look like us. <laughs> cow isn't funny, a cow doesn't look like us. Dogs are funny when they sit up and beg, because we beg. I had a dog that I once trained to say his prayers, and he would, he would uh, put his, his head between his paws and uh, wouldn't move until I said, Amen. <laughs> well, that was funny because he imitated a man. Then I also taught him, I would give him uh, candy or meat, anything that he liked, and say, Lent, fast. And he wouldn't touch it until I said Easter. <laughs> now, why is it that you do not meet laughter until you meet man? I once gave a, a telecast on another side of laughter, but here I'm going to discuss it in relationship to gloom in the universe today. But why is it that man alone begins laughter in the universe? The reason is very simple. Man belongs to two worlds. He is one, he has a divine image. And then he belongs to this animal world of ours, like an animal. Now, when you belong to two worlds, you've got really an opportunity for humor, for laughter. And the laughter begins whenever man begins to degrade, degrade slightly this divine image. Whenever there's a falling off from dignity, not the destruction of dignity, oh no. For example, death is not funny because that's the complete destruction. But where there is a decrease, a value in man, then there's laughter. Now, let's just take some simple examples. We often see men walking down the street with the, uh, the hat on the side of the head. We don't laugh at them. Did you ever see a bishop's mitre? It's a great big high hat pointed at the top. This is the yarmulke, this is not a mitre. But if I, uh, one Sunday, uh, one Sunday, wore my mitre on the side of my head like that, <laughs> I know a bishop who wears his, uh, wears his, uh, his uh, that way because he's bald in front. <laughs> well, that's funny, see? <laughs> because this is a slight degradation of the divine image. So the, the straw hat on a man that walks down Broadway is not funny, but the, a mitre on, cocked on the side of my head is very funny. Take, for example, a, uh, a dog running down the street is not funny, but a dog in church is very funny. <laughs> Any animal in church. Why? Simply because here there's a kind of an elevation out of the animal kingdom up to the divine. It's a kind of a simulation, an attempt to almost become, uh, become divine. And so it becomes very funny. I, I heard of uh, one priest who had a dog, and he, uh, he, uh, the dog came wandering around the altar. He was saying mass. And he gave it a kick at the... So he turned around and said, Lord, be with you. And he missed the dog and he said, I'll get you with the prey, brethren. <laughs> well, 
Today we see a lot of running and jogging. Running isn't funny. But if you see a man running after a woman, it's very funny. <laughs> Take, for example, a fall. We see chimneys fall. We see leaves fall. We see many things that imitate the law, follow the law of gravitation. But they're never funny. But if a man falls, that's really funny. Particularly if he considers himself very dignified. And maybe there's a profound theological significance in this. Perhaps it's a, it is related to original sin, the fall of man, which wasn't so funny in the beginning, but now is. And because man is at this borderline of the, of the divine and the, the, the animal, we never laugh at his strength. We laugh at his weakness because of the nobility of his image. For example, if you saw a, a strong man lifting weights, you wouldn't laugh. But have, you, have you ever seen a strong man trying to open a drawer? That's, that's very funny. And it's funny simply because there's the incongruity of this string not being able to open a drawer. Or trying to get, trying to get a cork out of a champagne bottle. <laughs> That's why everybody, everybody, when they open champagne at a party, everybody looks at the man who's opening the champagne. Because they want to see, if possible, if there's any kind of, of contrast. Well, that's the reason then for laughter, is because man is in some way related to the divine. Now let us get into the lighter side of it and discuss humor. What is humor and what makes anything humorous? Well, humor, I think, can be described in one word. Humor is transparency. We say, for example, if a man has no sense of humor, we say he's thick. If, however, he is a sense of humor, we say he can see through things. He will get puns, for example, points of stories. The over-serious man is like, he's like this, he's opaque, he can't see through it. The humorous man is like a, a window pane. Oh, it's like the glass on that television camera there. You can see through it. Now, who are the humorous people of the world? Well, all saints are, because they don't take anything very seriously. And that is why our blessed Lord spoke in parables. A parable is basically something very funny. For example, sunset is not a sunset. It's a revelation of the quickness of judgment. And. Uh, New wine in old bottles, not to be taken seriously. That's the story of trying to put new ideas into old institutions. Sheep and goats, good and bad. Good and bad fish, the holy and the unholy. All parables are based upon a transparent universe. Poets see that. Poets are marvelous at seeing it. For example, Thompson. I gave you once a telecast on Thompson. Oh, you missed that, did you? Well, you should have stayed in that night. Thompson calls the sun a host and the day a priest. And each morn, the day goes to the Orient Tabernacle, lifts from out it the host, raises it in benediction over the world, and then sets it in the flaming monstrance of the West. That's not taking a sunset very seriously. That's seeing the divine through it. Seeing the stars as glittering tapers lit about the day's dead sanctities. Wordsworth was walking through the forest once and he said to a companion, down on your knees, man, there are violets. And even the lighter things of life. One of the reasons I like to read Chesterton is because 
uh, he, he only took one or two things seriously. The salvation of his soul and the existence of God were about the two things that meant everything to him. And I love the story of when he met his future mother-in-law for the first time, Mrs. Boggs. And Mrs. Boggs, knowing that her future son-in-law was to come, had the house papered in a light gray color. And when Chesterton came in, Mrs. Boggs said, how do you like the wallpaper? And Chesterton took a crayon out of his pocket and drew along the wall the picture of his daughter, Frances, whom he wanted to marry. That to him, it was light to him, and she didn't say anything, so finally he married Frances Bogg and was very happy. And it wasn't for him, he, no telling where he would have ended because one day he was giving a lecture. He found himself in Liverpool and he sent her a telegram and he said, I'm in Liverpool, where ought I be? <laughs> and he could, he could write, uh, write interesting poems. We won't have time to, to give them, but I want to give you some funny poems and examples of, uh, of poets who see the, the funny things of life. One, G.K. Ch I mean, uh, Hilaire Belloc, who was a great friend of Chesterton. Hilaire Belloc wrote cautionary tales. And here is this very learned historian and literateur giving morals in a humorous way. And the story of this little cautionary tale for children is not to lie. But notice how lightly he takes it. He doesn't pound down like a heavy moralist. There's humor. And this is about Matilda. Matilda told such awful lies, it made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Her aunt, who from her earliest youth had kept strict, strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. The effort very nearly killed her and would have done so had not she discovered this infirmity. For once toward the close of day, Matilda, growing tired of play and finding she was left alone, went tiptoe to the telephone and summoned the immediate aid of London's noble fire brigade. Within an hour, the gallant band were pouring in on every hand from Putney, Hackney, Downs and Bow with courage high and hearts aglow, they gallop roaring through the town. Matilda's house is burning down. Inspired by British cheers and loud, proceeding from the frenzied crowd, they ran the ladders through a score of windows on the ballroom floor and took peculiar pains to souse the pictures up and down the house until Matilda's aunt succeeded in showing them they weren't needed. And even then she had to pay get the men to go away. Now it happened that a few weeks later, her aunt was off to the theater to see that interesting play, the second Mrs. Tangeray. She had refused to take her niece to hear this entertaining piece, a deprivation just and wise to punish her for telling lies. That night, a fire did break out and you should have heard Matilda shout. You should have heard her scream and bawl and throw the window up and call to people passing in the street. The rapidly increasing heat, encouraging her to obtain their confidence, but all in vain. For every time she shouted fire, they only answered, little liar. <laughs> and therefore, when her aunt returned, Matilda and the house were burned. <laughs> then remember the prayers that were translated from the French of the little donkeys, the little animals that went into the ark by Carmen Bernos de Gotzold. Uh, this is one on the donkey. Prayer of the poor donkey. And he prays to God and he says, God, who made me to trudge along the road always, to carry heavy loads always, and to be beaten always. Give me great courage of gentleness, 
And one day, let people, somebody, let somebody understand me that I may no longer want to weep because I can never say what I mean and they make fun of me. Let me find a juicy thistle and make them give me time to pick it. And Lord, one day, let me find again my little brother at the Christmas crib. That's taking the world lightly. And so on. And then there is, if I have time, there is also what is called by psychologists paradoxical intention. This is where we begin to laugh at ourselves. Spiritually, this means self-examination. And we do not take ourselves too seriously. But there are some people, for example, who, who get very nervous. When they have to meet people, their hands sweat. They get jittery. And the psychologists have developed paradoxical intention. And they will tell them to sweat just as much as you possibly can. And say to yourself, now I'm going to sweat. I never sweat it before like this, but I'm going to sweat and sweat and sweat. They, so they can stand off and really laugh at themselves and they give it up. There was a boy who stuttered. And so they gave him a stuttering part in a play. And he didn't stutter. <laughs> he didn't stutter because he had to stutter. And really, this, I don't have time to develop, but this is a spiritual exercise of laughing at ourselves. Even seeing ourselves as sinners bring on, brings on redemption. Do you know that there is one place in Scripture where God laughs? Did you know that? In fact, it's in several places, but there is one time. I have a minute and a half, do I? Yes. There is one time when God laughs. You'll find it in the second psalm. You'll find it in the book of Proverbs. You'll find it in another one of the psalms. I don't know whether to tell you when it is or not, where it is, or when it is. But it's this. God laughs when men say, he is dead. Interesting, isn't it? God must be splitting his heavenly sides. And all of our philosophers were saying that he is dead. That could be the prelude to judgment and to hard things. That wouldn't be a bit funny. And so maybe it's better for us all to realize that we wouldn't be so thirsty if we hadn't once tasted water. We wouldn't be so anxious and so distraught if we'd not already forgotten the good Lord. So let's not make God laugh. Let us laugh. I hope I make you happy and wiser. In any case, bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books, he broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly life is worth living.